Hello, and welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location, no matter where that location might be. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I am a part of the Gestalt IT family, and each episode we invite luminaries in the IT community to come on and debate an idea or a topic, perhaps even a premise. So before we get to the premise of today's episode, I would like to take a moment for our guests to introduce themselves, starting with Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Lopez. I'm Data Chick on Twitter. I blog at datamodel.com. I tweet a lot. I apologize for that. And I want everyone to love their data ethically. All right, Sam. Hi, everybody. I'm Sam Clements. You can find me on Twitter at Samuel underscore Clements. And I over at sc-wifi.com. Awesome. And Howard. And I'm Howard Marks, technologist, plenipotentiary, and extraordinary at Vast Data, where loving your data means keeping it on good storage. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you three for joining me today. Uh, let's jump into the premise of today's episode. Now, I'm sure if you are someone who consumes news as frequently as most of the people in the IT space do, you probably have heard a lot about companies doing things. And you may even have an opinion about those companies. Maybe there are some companies out there that are good and you like the things that they do. Or maybe there are some companies that are evil and they're doing bad things and we really wanna stop that. But I want you to stop and think for a second. Is it the company that's actually evil? Or is it the people at that company who are doing some shady or uh, shady things or perhaps some things that you would want to laud. So the premise for this episode is that companies are not inherently good or evil. Now, Sam, you are the one who brought this podcast topic to us. So I want you to kind of give us your thoughts to kick this off. You know, do you think that companies are inherently good or evil? Uh, you know, I don't. And, and I think it, it started with, um, I was, oh, X, Y, and Z company, uh, you know, technology, you know, sold too many APs to this customer. And now, you know, they're out on a boat relaxing and doing whatever. And there was this, there was this overwhelming um, sort of insinuation that, you know, when you, when you go with vendor, you're going to be, because they're going to sell you uh, more stuff than some of what was necessary in it. And it struck me as odd as I look around the ecosystem system of, of technology people um, uh, that it, that that's really couldn't be any further from the truth. I mean, I'm not entirely sure that um, there are there is such good versus an evil company, but I think that that it's easy to lambast, especially the companies, as being one way or the other. I would say yeah. that the opinion that most people have of the sales organization and IT is somewhere between neutral evil and chaotic evil. Karen, what do you think <laughs> about that? <laughs> Well, so I'm one of those people, I prefer to even think about people in general not being either evil. Like I don't see it as a black and white thing. I try so hard to focus on actions and behaviors and responses with people. And I wanna do the same thing with companies as well. So for instance, this week I tweeted my normal, one of my normal frustrations at UPS um, but a lot of carriers have been doing this. So delays in shipping, not just with the, U with the US postal system, since I'm in Canada, um, is that they have been updating their delays with various reasons for a delay, not that we're overwhelmed or due to the <laughs> pandemic, but it ranges from weather, which I know weather can impact deliveries, but when it's already in my town and it's a perfectly sunny day for 48 hours, I doubt that it's weather. And then the next update comes and says things like um, customer requested an alternative delivery, which of course I didn't do. And there've been a lot of people talking about this and they're really upset. This is likely due to a system error where there's nothing that says we're just overwhelmed in their dropdown list. So they're just choosing the ones either closest to the top. Is that evil? Well, as a data person, I think it's really bad. Did management tell them to do this? Is this the system error? It, trying to assess an overall grade to a person or a corporation, I think is just an odd thing to do. Well, I think it's important never to <clears throat> impugn evil, things that could easily be explained by stupidity and or sloth. Yes, there's that. Um, um, but on the other, you know, so I, you know, first of all, we have to talk about companies and products. You know, there are products with, there are products with no good use. Right? Cigarettes are, are close to, if not arguably 
truly an evil product. There's no good purpose for that. Um, when you get to oil, it's like, well, oil does evil, but we couldn't run our society without it. And that's different. Uh, and then you get to companies where the company is actually organized to do good. So in the tax code, there's a new class of companies called a B Corp, I mean, B for beneficial. And the problem with corporations, and in the example Sam gave, the problem with salespeople is incentives. Mm -hmm. And so if you tell salespeople that they make a commission, then some salesperson is going to go and sell every school in some Southern state, the same router, the one room schoolhouse and the 5,000 person high school will get the same router because he can convince somebody to do that and he'll sell several million dollars worth more gear and make more commission. So the concept of shareholder value as being the only thing that a corporation should care about is clearly something that's arguably evil because sh companies have stakeholders beyond shareholders. Look at the Hershey Corporation as an example. Hershey Foods is owned by the Milton Hershey um, School for Young Boys, an orphanage. And it exists to support the orphanage. If we're going to have a spectrum of good and evil, Hershey's pretty solidly on the good side. You know, Philip Morris, when it existed, pretty, pretty clearly on the evil side. But it's a spectrum. But I think part of the problem that we run into there, Howard, is that we're still ascribing emotions. We're still ascribing behaviors to an organization that technically, depending on where you're at, at analyzing it in the legal code, may or may not be alive. I mean, we have 100 plus years of landmark legal status here in the United States going all the way back to 1886 about whether or not a corporation is a person. And believe it or not, the Supreme Court has actually been very vague about this. They have ascribed certain rights to companies, but they have stopped short of saying that a company is a person. Now, Sam, you raised your hand. I, I, you want to jump in here? Yeah, I do. I, you know, I think it goes beyond just sort of the capital influence of, of you know, where money comes from and where it goes and how you incentivize get uh you know you peruse social media in day of the week and you'll see somebody who rails on a on a company as being bad because they support somebody doing something that they don't like right uh so and so doesn't support uh mental health awareness day therefore they are an evil company because their leader doesn't do blah what i think they should be doing and, and it, it's easy in the social media world to 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 distill to that black and white approach of of if you're, me, you're against me and and the only result is if you don't support everything I say 100% then you are clearly evil. It, then you get into the you know I stepped on a cockroach I intentionally killed an animal I'm evil. <laughs> um, you know hey. if, if we're if we're if we're if we're going to be at all reasonable and not let Twitter rule our lives, which I know is a stretch, um, then we should at least be concentrating on the company's, you know, what's the company's mission? What does it do to accomplish that mission? Does that mission make the world better? Um, a neutral company has a mission of making money by selling a product that satisfies a need and the product doesn't, vastly improve people's lives by its mere existence or vastly disable people's lives by its mere existence. Um, but, you know, if you sell a product that does more good, more harm than good, well, and that's the purpose your company exists for, then you're pushing up against evil. If you sell, if, if you sell products that do more good than harm, but you charge so much for them that people die because they can't afford them then that's another question. Karen? I'd like to go back to the, um, you know, there are probably some, I'm going to use the word organizations, not just company, that maybe because they're startups and they're not being truthful, such as the recent news about trying to decide, is it Nikola? Is that the, comp the new company that has the mm -hmm. e-truck that may or may not have demonstrated it accurately as actually propelling itself <laughs> rather than running down a hill? 
does that, does their foray into the world of raising money and trying to get people excited about the company, if it's such a, if it's so misleading to people, whether they intended that or not. Yeah, there's a word for that, fraud. Yeah, I'm trying to stay away from the <laughs> words, but, um, you know, does that make the whole organization bad? And what about Theranos? And what about all, and what about almost every company on Indiegogo and Kickstarter that never ships anything? A lot of those are just people who have no idea how to do manufacturing at scale. I get that. And it's gotten to the point where this, the third, the, the hosting companies, Indiegogo and um, Kickstarter, I no longer do these investments, which is the word they use, because there's literally no recourse to them faking a product, right? There's no, like, so I don't have a need for their service anymore, um, no matter how cool the thing is that they want to sell. I'll just wait till- Ignorance and defense. Yeah, I, I I mean I think you hit the nail square on the head, which is it, which is if it's unintentional, um, it, is that a defensible position? But should they let uh, Kickstarters, people, and companies now more likely companies continue to do this eight times in a row? Come up with a great idea, say well, then, that they can't deliver because of manufacturing and adopt taking too long and. Uh, costing too much and they just failed and folded and took all the money. Like how many times should these third party companies allow that to happen? Well, the question is how many times should they allow that to happen in the aggregate or how many times should they let one scammer do that? Oh, that's what I mean. One scammer. And, uh, once. Yeah. That, and, and again, people. Well, well, well but what's to stop that? But, but the def then you get into what's the definition of that scammer. Exactly. Is it the exactly. LLC? Cause I have seven. Yes, exactly. But the fact that they just let, um, and, there, and there's this whole secondary business of like one of the things I invested in, I was really excited about. And it turns out that it was posted and managed by a, yet a second third party company that runs these um, fundraisers, these crowdfunding things for other product developers. So when it turned out to be a scam, they said, you know, it's not our fault. You can't take us to court. You can't do any of this because we're just the promoter. But they are the ones who had the account on Kickstarter. So okay. I'm getting into the weeds here because I'm saying it's kind of hard to root out evil in processes and procedures and standards and policies and implementations, even if the board and the CEO is kind-hearted, wants to do the right thing, wants to do no evil. So I would, I would actually, Karen, one thing you said there that kind of stood out, you, you had named off a couple of companies that, um, at least in Silicon Valley, tend to have a negative connotation, um, not because yeah. of the company as a whole, but because mm -hmm. of some specific person who had been at the front of that company making very questionable yes. decisions, making yeah. very bad business decisions. And, and we could argue until the cows come home yeah. about whether or not that's the case or whether they're trying to hide behind things. But I think that a lot of what we're dealing with here, at least not from outside forces, which we'll get into in just a minute, but, but some of these smaller companies a lot of what's going on is impacting the people that work there, yeah. not because they are just, you know, foot soldiers for evil, but because someone above them is making decisions that are forcing them to do things that they may not like. And I think all of us in IT have a friend or know someone who works for a company that made a different business decision that may not be agreeable to people in the community for one reason or another. And then suddenly they're the bad guys and our friends who don't make those decisions yeah. Yeah. are forced to abide by them because that's what you got to do to get paid. So how do you deal with that situation if you're working for one of those companies? And, and that's a really good point because, um, so I'll bring up another name. There's all this contentious issues across the U.S. especially for companies that do work for ICE. Now, as an immigrant to Canada and from a family of immigrants to the U.S., um, I see an important role for immigration, right? I'm, I'm in a fan of that. I'm not, and I'm not anti-immigration organizations at all. But now we have employees inside of companies standing up to their own companies for working with a government organization that they believe is not doing good things or not working on behalf of society. 
And I think, you know, now, since I'm experienced, I think it's really interesting to see this change of seeing especially well-paid employees who are making tons of money in IT standing up to their organizations and saying, we don't want to work here. And organizations kind of, of listening because they're, they can't afford to lose a hundred people overnight. It, but judging an organization by its customers is a very slippery slope. Right. So that, this is and, you know, it, it's kind of like, okay, management is going to deal with, well, these 40 important guys are going to quit if we deal with anyone they don't approve of. So mm -hmm. I have to ask all of my employees to please submit the list of people of companies. If we sell to you would quit, you know, this becomes very complicated and, and it does. And it's a hostage know, situation at that point. I mean, it, come on, a, that's call it a, what it is. It's approaching the social media part. Now, if you make facial recognition software whose purpose, you know, it's kind of like if yeah. Microsoft sells Windows to ICE, Microsoft yeah. sells Windows to everybody. Right. And objecting to that is, you know, just putting management in an impossible situation. But saying, I will know, you know, I have been working for this company that does facial recognition that's now you selling it to the Chinese so that he can identify Uyghurs and lock them up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, now you're going, well, first of all, you might have thought about the evil that the nuclear weapons you were working on could have been used for before you put the plutonium in them. Um, and second of all, you might have a point. Mm -hmm. um, but that's what the company does more than who it sells to. Right. But it's not just selling to in all of these cases. Like I'm no, not no, no. In, 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 the, in cases, it, it is much more. It's, you know, we yes. are helping. Yeah. We are, you know. Like if I go to work for- I will not, I, I would not work for the private prison company that runs detention centers for anyone. That's right. Because but, but we all know that government programs or some of these programs that we've mentioned, it takes, you know, dozens and dozens of contracting age. Like no work is actually done for the most part by the government. It's done by contractors. And right. that's, they can be flexible and and- hire expertise that they can't keep forever and all the normal reasons one would hire a contractor. I think the hard part is, is that um, it's 2020 and we are living in interesting times. And these are not just people like, for instance, I'm vegetarian. I work for companies that sell meat and that's just something I have to deal with. Right. But when I was invited to go work for a meat processing company, I said, no, I don't see myself every day working on these projects, right? So that's a personal choice of one person. But when we're talking about hundreds or thousands of staff saying, we don't want to be part of this because even our jobs touch those projects. That's the interesting part for me. So let me jump in here because I want to touch on the a point that I brought up just a minute ago that might kind of tie some of this together. For someone who, say, works for themselves or works for a small company, they have the ability to say to themselves, well, I don't want to work for this company. I don't want to do business with yeah. this company because I disagree with their policies. But when you get to a company of a certain size, they're no longer beholden to their values. They are beholden to a value that is derived from stakeholders or shareholders. And companies are rewarded routinely for meeting those expectations and punished severely when they do not. And we're all familiar with uh, the stock market, whether it's Wall Street or FTSE or any of the other ones around the globe. And we've seen what's happened in the last several decades when you are faced with a situation where a company makes decisions not based on their moral compass, but on their balance sheet. And so could it be that part of the reason why we're seeing companies making more questionable behavior is not because they're inherently evil or even the people that work for them are inherently evil, but because the people that invest in them and the people that are looking at them have removed morality from the conversation completely and just said, make me some money. The the concept that the only purpose of a corporation is to support shareholder value is just the worst thing that's happened to American management in the past 40 years. 40 years ago, um, stock buybacks were illegal. 
if the company had extra money and it wanted to give it to the shareholders, it declared a dividend. And that rewarded the people who held the stock. But today you do a stock buyback, which boosts the price of the stock and boosts the executive compensation, which is based on the stock price by giving money to the people who are willing to give up the stock, not the people who keep the stock. Make you, the whole concept that the only reason the company exists is to boost shareholders' values is just wrong. Companies exist to support their stakeholders, and those stakeholders include employees and customers and previous employees to whom you have a social contract. And Wall Street rewards you for stock price and punishes you if you don't declare bankruptcy so you can get rid of your pension obligations. Now, Sam, you had something. I want to have you jump in here and then I want to go to Karen. Um, you know, the, the point though is that um, we all as people who invest, at least if you have a 401k or, uh, you know, pick, pick whatever your retirement plan is, uh, that's what we want, right? I mean, that's what we as people who are uh, leveraging those systems, uh, hopefully to retire out of someday, that's what our expectation is. If I look at my uh, 401k portfolio, I don't go and go, oh, company X is something that's good or bad. I look at the dollar figure. Uh, that, that's at the, at the end of the day when the piece of paper in the mail, that's what I look at. I, I, I do look at, like, one of the companies I own is solely for managing my investments. So um, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, where I want my money to go. So I don't, like, there are companies I really don't like, but I still own stock in them because... I don't think they're evil. I just think they're companies I don't like. And my goal is to make money on that investment. That's why that company exists. So in a sense, I am playing to shareholder value, but that shareholder is me. Um, no, if, but, if you're a shareholder, you should care about shareholder value. Yes. And, but, I'm, and I'm not saying shareholder value isn't a goal. Mm -hmm. I'm saying making shareholder value the goal. Yeah, I'm getting there. The problem. So, Go ahead, Karen. So, so Henry Ford said, a business that makes nothing but money is a poor business. And I agree a lot with you, Howard. But one of the things is, I think we've also, like we've mentioned a couple of things that change, that have changed over the years, especially in the US on how businesses are governed. And some of those are things about them, corporations getting more and more rights, but they can't be sent to prison um, and, and all of that, finding that balance. Some of the other things though are, you know, one of the things that drives me crazy is businesses that manage to quarterly reporting. I mean, that is not a universal thing on the globe. That's very much a first, a North American and then an industrialized, uh, a Western industrialized nation, how they manage quarterly returns. Like businesses that manage to quarterly returns often make just horrible decisions about society and their employees and all of those things. So it's not any one thing that makes share, managing to shareholder value awful. It's the combination of it all. Um, things like taxation policy and monetary policy. Um, for years in Canada here, in my pension investments, I was only allowed to own 10% of foreign investments. That meant like any stocks outside of Canada. Finally, those uh, restrictions have gone away because those protectionist policies for, Cad for Canadian companies ended up hurting Canadians because we just couldn't take part of investments in really innovative companies that were based outside of Canada. Those kinds of policy things though, really shape how businesses react to certain things and those are external forces there. And I really sound like a capitalist pig here, but I assure you I'm a hippie when it comes to most things in my <laughs> life. I've just, maybe I've reached that age where um, I've gotten more uh, fiscally conservative while being wildly radically uh, radicalized in social policies. I'm not sure. 
So Karen, I actually want to I want to make a comment there and maybe pose a question to the panel because it's actually something that is broad, more broadly debated where it, it in the wider community, actually in the wider world. Um, depending on the issue, there are always two sides. And in this particular case, there is one political ideology that believes that business should be allowed to do whatever business wants to do, completely unfettered by any laws or regulations, and that ultimately it the business itself will fail or succeed based on its own merits and will choose to do good if the if it's good for the business mm -hmm. the other political ideology says that businesses must be restrained from doing the worst of things because given the opportunity they will do those things and we must do everything in our power to prevent them from crossing those lines now those lines have been back and forth for a number of years and we constantly see the pendulum swinging to restrict business, to allow business to do things. And e the opinion is either we haven't given business enough time to figure out that being good for people is good for them versus watch, see what they did in the last five years. We need to, we need to start restricting them. So is the answer to this whole idea that companies may, may not be inherently good or evil to put the shackles on them and prevent them from ever being able to develop a morality? Do you, do you treat people that way? The same political ideology, the people who hold the same political ideology that corporations should be completely unfettered and have no regulations are the ones who want very long sentences for criminal acts by people. If people can be evil and people run corporations, corporations can be evil. And if they can be evil, they have to be stopped from being evil. I am old enough. I grew up in New York in the 1960s where every apartment building had a garbage incinerator and black smoke poured out of those garbage incinerators on a daily basis. I watched the Cuyahoga River burn. The reason those things don't happen isn't because corporations realized that putting in more expensive garbage handling was a good thing and they decided to do it. It's because they we instituted the Clean Air Act and we put and the Clean Water Act, and we said, if you dump oil in the Cuyahoga River and it catches fire, and the bridge over the river burns to the ground, which did actually happen, it's your fault and you have to pay for it. And if we don't have any regulations, then you people will run bust outs, where I will build a factory and I will dump pollution into the ground and I will make $10 million a year for 10 years, and then I will declare bankruptcy and somebody else has to clean it up. The problem we haven't talked about is that our current system socializes risk and privatizes reward. That corporations do things, they pay small fines and keep large profits and the cost of the evil that they do is left to the people to clean up, right? The whole Superfund program is the government cleaning up after people who made messes they didn't clean up themselves. I would say that's probably pretty fair, Howard. And I, if we get into this whole, you know, privatized profit, socialized risk thing, this is probably an entirely different episode of a podcast. But I want to give <laughs> Sam and Karen a chance to kind of react to this idea, you know, should we shackle corporations to prevent them from developing morality? Yes. <laughs> that was super easy. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, you know, you you have to have some, um, you, you have to somebody somewhere has to be responsible, and and it's the same problem that I have with, um, electric vehicles, right? They sound fantastic and wonderful, but to the best nobody has told me what's done with all those batteries in 10, 15, 20 when they are no longer good and they end up in landfills. Uh, that's fantastic. Electric cars, obviously fantastic to the environment today. What happens in 20, 30 years from now? And, and I, and I think that it it's short-sighted. Um, it's, it's far too often that it's short-sighted that, that we don't get a chance as a consumer to look at the entire impact of everything that we are buying right then and there. If we did, I think a lot of people would uh, be, be making significantly different decisions um, in technology and in our purchases. Karen? So I was going to bring up the electric car thing too, which is I'm dying to own one as soon as I get rid of my 28 year old car. But, uh, <laughs> but um, that the other sort of ethical sort of bad, good, bad thing about that product besides the batteries 
is the fact that, yeah, it's clean running only because the energy it needs is produced somewhere else. Somewhere else, yeah. And and everything. So I think people do understand that part. Most people aren't thinking to the batteries part unless they're really into cars and they want to sell it before the battery goes bad. Uh, like if, if you leave out the coal electric generation component, which is, <laughs> well, which is declining rapidly. Yeah, um, but still someone else uh, has to deal with the cleanup of producing energy. Yeah, but a natural gas electric, electrical plant Mm-hmm. And an electric car is net about 30% more efficient yeah. than a gasoline car. So there's, yeah. there's a net advantage. And where I live, we have lots of nuclear power and hydropower. Right? Well, you guys so ha- actually had a good nuclear reactor design, but that's a whole other story. Well, that's a whole other podcast as well, because our nuclear reactors are getting old and they're not being replaced. So we have all that. But one of the things I wanted to throw out here is... This is also a very US conversation, I just want to say. I mean, this, this conversation about do you regulate corporations or do you let the market um, you know, manage bad behaviors? And that's definitely always going to be a classic discussion about how, how does society manage corporations and regulate them. All right. Well, I think when it comes to the premise of whether or not a company is inherently evil or not, I think that the answer really comes down to what is the driving factor for that company to do business? Is it for doing money? Is it for doing good? And are there any other factors that are driving that company to do things that may call into question their morality? And that all depends on who the people working for that company are and the decisions that they make as to whether or not they want to do business with a specific organization, whether or not the figurehead of the company has enough power to just say, I'm gonna do what I want, and whether or not external factors such as investment firms and things like that have the ability to drive people to do things they wouldn't normally do. And the answer is never going to be 100% clear on any form of this because a lot of what we talk about is not dictated by the market or by the legal system, but whether or not people are capable of being moral enough to draw a line in the sand and say, this is too far for me to go. I wanna thank everyone for joining us on this panel. Uh, It was a great discussion. I'm sure that we will have more great discussions like this in the future on the On-Premise IT Roundtable. If you'd like to check out episodes of our podcast, please head to gestaltit.com slash podcast to find the latest episode. You can also check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash gestaltit video. If you are more of a listener, You can check us out in your favorite podcast application of choice. You can also find us on iTunes. And if you find us over there, please leave us a like and a review so that people who are searching for things to listen to on their morning run can find this and hopefully learn a little something. So for myself, Tom Hollingsworth, for the great panelists that we had today and for the rest of the Gestalt IT community, thank you very much for listening and we'll see you again soon.